than expressions of our world community. community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, you are welcome here today. Uh, yeah, my name is John Sproul, my pronouns are he and him, and I am the service leader today, um, uh, helping uh, uh, produce this service with our Reverend, Reverend Mor um, Rosemary Morrison. We respectively acknowledge that we're located on Treaty 6 territory. It's a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Ashinanabe, Inuit and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We ask that you take a moment right now uh, to ensure that your cell phones and noise emitting devices are silenced. You can be a noise emitting device later when we kind of join in some hymns, but otherwise it can um, be silent. And online you can just sing as loud as you want. We are glad to have you with us here this morning. We hope you find something in the service today that nourishes your spirit and helps you find and keep your balance. And I have just one announcement uh, today. Oh, there's two. Okay, well, first I will give one that was um, handed to me. <clears throat> Gordon Ritchie, please, anyone who's in the sanctuary, request some help moving the Christmas decorations up to the mezzanine. So if people can kind of uh, help with that, that would be great. Uh, is there any other announcements? Just here. Good morning. I think most of you know me. I'm Brandi Muller Reed, the board president, and my name or my pronouns are she and her. Um, normally, I stand up here and wing it, and I actually have notes, so you know I mean business, right? It's like mom voice here. Um, so I wanted to be here last week for Reverend Rosemary's service because it kind of ties into that, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. Um, as most of you know, we had a crisis at the church this past week with open doors in our rental space, and it affected the whole church with the sprinkler system being down. I need to publicly thank Andrew Mills and Janet, who without these two, we would be Yes, underwater, more impolite words, um, yes. So they oversaw all the trades, they reorganized rentals, exact, everything, it was awesome. Um, did the fire watch, I was working with insurance, everything like that. Also, I know John Pater and David Ray were here at the drop, they were lucky enough to be on Andrew's speed dial at 10 o'clock that evening. So thank you to those guys who came out and everybody else who did um, fire watch. That kind of pulling together is exactly what our church thrives on and without it, we cannot function. We need everybody here to help out and it's all hands on deck. And in the last several years, we've seen quite a few changes. Um, people have retired from their previous commitments on committees. COVID put a huge pause on a lot of committees and everything. Uh, we've had our minister retire, an interim minister who is never in the building, and of course now we have our wonderful Reverend Rosemary who's in full swing. So as we get back to the regular business of UCE, we're finding that we have gaps. Um, committees that were suspended or disbanded now have no way of organizing volunteers. And as Reverend Rosemary mentioned in her service last week, just before um, Christmas, she was feeling extremely overwhelmed with all the little extras that were cropping up. We have our traditional services that, you know, who normally handle that, they have retired and moved on. And to keep that stuff going, we need to help lighten her load. So as a representative of the board and with the support of Reverend Rosemary, I would like to ask that we start to think about how we repopulate these volunteer roles and have people helping on committees again. There's key committees such as the membership committee, the building maintenance committee that are desperate for volunteers. Our building maintenance committee, um, most of the members are over 80 and they're tired. Our Mike Keast, who has been our rock, has a new job that frequently takes him out of town. Um, so the board is working on 
alternative strategies for this, but in the meantime, we also need fresh blood on this committee. Um, and the HR committee will also, has also sent out a survey about how we can best utilize the position left blank by our RE director, and Lynn will be talking about that more in the future. Um, but we still need to have our volunteers in place. We need people to help up with Sunday services, specifically before the service or after in the kitchen, setting up, um, helping to prepare and host events, just to name a few things. Um, we need both people to step up and seek out ways that they can help, as well as the board and Reverend Rosemary need to do a better job of asking for help. So in that endeavor, um, I'm trying to look for ways to get people more involved. I will be creating hopefully volunteer links that will be sent out in your weekly Friday emails and in the newsletter. If, so you can stay tuned for that. If you see a gap or an event that you would like to have take place, please come forward. Come talk to the board, come talk to Reverend Rosemary, but not just suggest the event, but be prepared with people um, to help run it. We are thrilled by suggestions for this church. We want this church to be a bustling community where we have people that can engage in activities and find peace in everything, but we can't just rely on our reverend or on certain volunteers uh, to host it. You can help in little ways, 15 minutes before the start of the service. It can be a one-time thing. It can be ongoing, um, leading a, or chairing a committee in big ways too. Every little bit helps. Um, and like Reverend Rosemary said last week, even things like cleaning coffee cups after a service, if you know how to do it, grab somebody, take a friend with you, teach them. If you don't know how or there's gaps in, you know, how do we run the dishwasher, let us know. We'll write up procedures in that so that it makes it easier for everybody. Volunteering with others deepens our connections and our friendships. Um, if you don't know where to start, please feel free to reach out to Reverend Rosemary or myself. And the one thing that I was going to mention as we kick off this campaign um, has already been announced. We need people to help put away Christmas decorations. Our beloved Gordon um, took the initiative with Robert to organize it, to get them all set up, and now we need somebody to help put it all away. Um, and I think that's a good place to start. So that's where my long-winded speech ends. So thank you everybody and I'll let you get on with the service. Good morning everyone. My name is Karen Belita. My pronouns are she and hers. Last night we had our monthly dragging youth all ages drag show that's sponsored by the church. Um, so we did a pass the hat last night which we don't normally do. And so half of it went to the charity that we were fundraising for, which is Patty's Community Parcels, which is a delivery food bank sort of service. And we raised $1,000 for them last night. But half the hat also went to the church. So we raised $118.80 for the church last night. And we've decided that our April show will be a fundraiser for the church, helping with the deductibles of all the insurance and all the stuff and we really appreciate what the church does for the Dragon News shows and just wanted to send a thank you for everyone. That's awesome. Thank you, Karen. I, I just have a couple of very brief things. My name is Rosemary Morrison. Hello. Good morning. I am the minister here at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton that you can probably tell because I have the stole on. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I wanted to let you know that, um, as many of you know, Don Royer passed away and his funeral memorial service will be this coming Saturday at 1 p.m. here in the sanctuary. And um, the following Monday is you use on tap at Brewster's anytime after 5.30. And our karaoke and spaghetti eating night has been postponed this month. We weren't sure exactly when we'd be able to open up, so we just let it go for this month. So February 16th, get ready, get your songs ready for karaoke. Uh, thank you very, very much, everyone. And now um, <clears throat> we can enter a time of quiet and um, prepare yourselves for the uh, 
uh, service. We do have um, the, uh, the United States has Lionel Richie to play music about love, but we have our own Gordon Ritchie who will be playing uh, a tune. Um, yes. <laughs> Distant, distantly related. So just lay back and enjoy and get in the mood for the service. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And now we have our traditional uh, lighting of the chalice, and I'd like to ask Fer uh, Fergie Verbicki to come and light the chalice on our, uh, behalf of everyone as I read these words, the flames of love. We light the flame of commitment. We stand with and work to create change until all know they are beloved. We light the flame of change, committing to recenter toward love in hearts, in minds, in our world. We light the flame of hope, loving each other, building community, even when it is uncomfortable. We light the flame of knowledge, following the path of justice, justice that is love embodied. We light this flame as a people committed. We will change the world until no one lives without hope, until no one lives without justice. We light this flame and pledge that in love, with love, and through love, all things are possible. And uh, now um, we have an opportunity. This is, uh, I love this hymn, actually. It was, it was my parents' favorite hymn. If we could be rise, if you're willing to, able to sing hymn number 1028, Fire of Commitment.
I love that kind of thing. Uh, now I have the great privilege, because when you get to be a service leader, you get asked to kind of provide a, a quick um, reflection. And so I'm just going to provide a few comments um, that my mind wandered to. Uh, one is I think the theme was about love um, and certainly commitment. And um, it's interesting, love is such a t challenging word because we love spaghetti and we kind of love our grandmother and various things. Sanskrit has 96 words for love. Ancient Persian has 80, Greek has three, and English has one. So it's a bit of a challenging thing to fit so many things in that concept. What, I, what do I love? Uh, and I was thinking about, about commitment and various things around this time of year. Um, I, I do love privilege, personally. Uh, and I am one of a person of privilege, and I recognize that. I feel extremely lucky, um, sometimes guilty, but mostly lucky, but also a responsibility from having such privilege to care for others and to do my bit. And that's been very kind of strong and grown as I, as I grow older. And that's certainly one of the reasons I come to the church for my community and my world. In this world this year, it's been a challenging one. And I was reading actually Dickens, who's one of my favorite kind of guys, and I was uh, uh, re-looking at the tale of two cities and I was thinking the beginning of the tale of two cities, if you know, uh, and I thought that this current past year was every second line. It was the worst of times, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was a season of darkness, it was the winter of despair. Last year sucked, frankly. <laughs> um, and the world has become, I think, a dehumanizing space with lots of judgment, isolation, attacking, and assumptions of others. We're all in cliques and fiefdoms. And there was a book, a recent book that I read, David Brooks, who I admire. He's on PBS NewsHour, actually, and he just wrote a book, How to Know a Person, and it provided some strong lessons for me. And he states in it, there is one skill that lies at the heart of any healthy person, family, school, community organization, or society, the ability to see someone else deeply and make them feel seen, to accurately know another person, to let them feel valued, heard, and understood. And yet we humans don't do this well. All around us are people who feel invisible, unseen, misunderstood. We should be such active listeners that we burn calories doing it. Uh, and it's good New Year's resolution for me to burn calories through active listening and love strangers. And it's hard to listen to some strangers I know because there's a lot of, um, I can use this word in the Unitarian Church, assholes and arrogant punks, pipsqueaks and bullies in the world. <laughs> and so I don't want to kind of say, and, and I had said this once before, I, uh, being involved in theater, there's some great bards insults that I can give you which you might use to describe some of these people. Um, I do desire we may be better strangers, is from uh, As You Like It. Uh, you are as a candle, the better part burnt out, by Henry IV. And then my best one, I think, is from Taming of the Shrew, is I would challenge you to a battle of wits, but I see you un are unarmed. <laughs> <clears throat> and I am uncertain and anxious for the new year, but cautiously hopeful for even the most villainous people in our world because what Robinson Crusoe said in the Daniel Defoe book, it is never too late to be wise. So I hope that occurs. And there was a quote for me of, of that uh, I try to live my life by in thinking about what I love. Uh, George Bernard Shaw once said, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown on the scrap heap. The being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish, little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of my opinion that my life belongs to the community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die for the harder they, I work, the more I live. Life is no brief candle to me. It's sort of a splendid torch, which I've got hold of for the moment. And I want to make it burn so brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. And so for the future, this next year, I hope 2024 is the every other second line from A Tale of Two Cities. And we can say at the end, it was the best of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the epoch of belief. It was the season of light. And it was the spring of hope. 
So I hope that's what we have in 2024. Um, the US elections, God help us. Um, but uh, now in terms of providing hope for others and not just ourselves and committing to our community, it's now time to share our abundance. Traditionally, our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting, and one of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all the financial support for many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, as shown earlier by the announcements, uh, is one of the great spiritual values we recognize as central to our own personal and institutional well-being. And in addition to supporting the church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls and one half of the identified cash goes to an outside organization, some are local, some national, international. And for the month of January, we are sharing our abundance with Change for Children. And for over 45 years, Change for Children has promoted health and human rights by championing creative solutions to poverty through sustainable development. This has been and continues to be the Change for Children way to build civil society capacity, for, to the, in the global south and Canada to promote health, human rights, and create solutions to poverty through sustainable uh, development. And they're a wonderful, wonderful organization. At, uh, at the link which is provided, in order to uh, provide the donations for, uh, to the UCE, but also for our charity of the month. Thanks very much. And actually, if you could all rise as you're willing and able to sing, uh, well, you don't have to rise, actually, you can stay sitting. Uh, from you, I receive, and I'll take the collection. And now um, we're going to have a responsive uh, reading. And if the words can come up, uh, I, uh, you are the yellow. Sometimes it's all, including me. And I am the white. I will be the leader, which is a great place to be. Um, <clears throat> but if you can just follow along to the uh, words that are on the screen at home and here on the uh, screen in the sanctuary. You are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether tears have fallen from your eyes this past week or gleeful laughter has spilled out of your smiling mouth. You are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you're feeling brave or brokenhearted, defiant or defeated, fearsome or fearful. You are beloved. Whether you have untold stories buried deep inside or stories that have been forced beyond the edges of comfort, whether you have made promises, broken promises, or are renewing your promises, whatever is on your heart, however it is with your soul in this moment, In this space of welcome and acceptance, commitment and recommitment, of covenant and connection, all are welcome, all are loved. Thank you very much. And now we have the hymn of the month. Uh, there is a love by Canada's Lionel Music Man, Gordon Ritchie.
Thank you, John. That was, I loved your reflection. Thank you. I, I always choose not to get it ahead of time. I want to be, I want to hear it when you hear it and have it land as part of the service. I just, it's so awesome. Thank you. Reminded me of a, a story, um, the different kinds of love. So um, I had a foster child named Jamie. This isn't part of what I was going to talk about this morning. But, uh, and he, um, he came into the world with some disadvantages. And he, had, um, he, he really struggled with food. He was, he was always hungry. And he, he may not have gotten as much food as he needed when he was first born. And so he had a real thing about food. He hoarded it. He, he loved food. So he, he saw the, in elementary school, he went to see a psychologist. And the psychologist gave him some work to do and, um, at his level. And uh, she said, what are the different kinds of love do you think in your life? And he fills it all out and gives it back. And in there he said, there's the love of hamburgers. And there's the love of pizza. <laughs> and there's the love of spaghetti and meatballs. And there's the love of cake <laughs> and cookies. It was just, he just listed all his favorite foods. It's the love of, <laughs> it was so cute. It was so cute. It was like, oh, this is telling. It gave me a lot to, uh, quite a bit of insight on this little guy who was eight when, when he first came to live with us with his sister who was 10 and... Uh, we had him till he was 18, 19, 20, something like that. Anyway, what are you in love with? I'm going to read a couple of chapters from the Tao Te Ching um, as our reading, as our words this morning to think about uh, along with words that have entered my heart and soul to share with you. So this is a Stephen Mitchell translation, chapter 11. We join spokes together in a wheel, but it is the center hole that makes the wagon move. We shape clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside that holds whatever we want. We hammer wood for a house, but it is the inner space that makes it livable. We work with being but non-being is what we use. And chapter 29. Do you want to improve the world? I don't think it can be done. The world is sacred. It can't be improved. If you tamper with it, you'll ruin it. If you treat it like a lo an object, you'll lose it. There is a time for being ahead, a time for being behind. A time for being in motion, a time for being at rest. A time for being vigorous, a time for being exhausted, a time for being safe, and a time for being in danger. The master sees things as they are without trying to control them. She lets them go on their own way and resides in the center of the circle. End of reading. So, what are you in love with? One of the things that I'm in love with is shared ministry. Well, what is shared ministry, you might ask. And by the way, Brandy, this sermon goes along quite well. <laughs> it's a two-in-a-row kind of sermon. Anyway, so shared ministry is what, all, is what I'm all about. I think that everyone that is involved with a congregation or has access to it can benefit from shared ministry. In her article on the UUA website called Putting the Shared in Shared Ministry, Renee Rutchcox writes, one of the most important factors in a vibrant congregation is a high level of co covenantal trust between the minister and the lay leaders. When I say covenantal, I intentionally mean the promises made between the leaders and members, and in service to that which is greater than the congregation itself, articulated by its mission. So our mission statement is what kind of rules the church, and we look to our vision as well to 
as something to live into. But who knows the mission statement? Got it memorized? Me neither. Don't feel bad. I don't know it either. So I looked it up, and here it is. The UCE mission is to inspire social justice by questioning the status quo, engaging community, and inviting all to the table. And how do we do that? Part of the mission statement tells us how we do that. By providing an intentionally inclusive home to nurture spiritual growth and transformation. Sure, we can do that this week. Foster learning opportunities and outright outreach experiences. Welcome all age groups. I see all age groups here today. Support action for social justice and be guided by the principles and sources of Unitarian Universalism. Well, that's not a tall order, is it? So let's take a sneak peek at our vision as well, shall we? We open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. And I became a little bit curious. What are the, what are the similarities between the two? And I, I've been really interested in Venn diagrams uh, recently. And uh, my favorite being the one that in the middle, uh, put your hands up. I love that. Uh, no, no, put your hands in the air. And so preacher is in one of them, and the, and the bank robber is in another, and a mom helping a kid put on their sweater is in another, and they all overlap with, put your hands in the air. Anyway, um, so I was curious where the overlaps were between the two statements, between our vision statement and our mission statements. What words appear in both? Uh, of course, I just kind of, as, at the same time, I want to remind you that you, you crafted and created the mission and vision statements. They were crafted by a group of people. They went back to the congregation for revisions. Feedback was given. More revisions were made. And then here we are with a mission and vision statement that were crafted by this congregation. And so the words that have overlap, which I consider to be if they overlap after all that work, if these words were on both things, these must be really important to you. That was my thinking anyways. And the words that overlap on these two are nurture, spiritual, and growth. Those three words are on both your mission statement and your vision statement. Both of these statements look to us to make positive changes in people's lives create opportunities for people to experience outreach. And there is a focus on learning in both of them. That's a lot, isn't it? And how are we going to do it all? I spoke last week about how important it is to get involved, that we only get out of something that was put into it. And I believe so strongly in the wonderful people of UCE. And I want you to have all the things. All the things. I want you to have everything. I want you to be a vibrant congregation that has opportunities for spiritual and religious education. A social justice team that is learning about reconciliation and is beginning to understand all that entails. Monthly potlucks of programs for all ages, both on Sunday mornings and throughout the week. People checking in on one another and nurturing one another. There's that word again, that nurture word. People having fun together at events. An understanding of how important it is to stay for coffee afterward and have snacks at every service. There's, there's where we can visit with newcomers and with one another. And that's how we build kindness and best, assuming best intentions into our community. <clears throat> Has anybody else noticed how dry it is these days? Oh, man. And how in the world are we going to make all of this happen? It's a lot of things, and just so you know, I can help, but I can't make them all happen for you. 
There is a lovely imagery in the passage from the Tao that I read, Tao, pardon me, thinking about that wagon wheel or a bike wheel. It is the center hub, right, that is so important. The center space is where the power is. And the spokes then move the energy out. What do you see is the center of UCE? Where is the energy of UCE coming from? What makes the wheel move forward? In some congregations I've worked with or been at, a, a part, I've been a part of, it is the minister that's kind of at the center of that wheel, and they move things forward. In others, it's the board that moves things along. And that still others, it's a program council or the general membership. The best model I've seen is when all of those things are in play and that everyone is working together to create that energy, to move the wheel forward. And that's what shared ministry is all about. We do it together. Social justice is at the core of our mission statement. That our mission is to inspire social justice by questioning the status quo, engaging community, and inviting all to the table. There are so many things that I think probably need to be put into place before we can even begin to think about doing social justice in the public or private sphere. First, we have to have systems in place to support us, nurture us, there's that word again, and attend to our spiritual growth. As well, we need opportunities to get to know one another better, not just those you choose to hang out with or have lunch with. In that vein, I've been modeling for you the importance of getting better acquainted. I often supply a snack for a Sunday morning. I've been hosting You Use on Tap once a month. I've started the third Friday thing, Fridays for Fun and Food. That's the spaghetti, karaoke, potluck. It hasn't been a potluck. It's been soup and games or whatever. I organized a pancake breakfast so that people could come and share in the, U, in the CUC service and, uh, and, then, and then would be here to help decorate the sanctuary. These events have been somewhat well received, uh, but the important thing that happens at these events is that people get talking, right? They get creative, they, they come up with ideas, they decide they're going to do an activity, do a thing, anything, and they get to know one another better. And that's what it's all about, is for us to be getting to know one another. Those relationships get formed. We support one another. We find out that somebody might need something at, a, at an event or at coffee after, and, and we help them out. And then that means that we begin to trust the system enough so that we can actually begin to ask for help. Because I don't know about you, but giving help is a lot easier for me than it is to ask for help. In fact, it's really hard for me to ask for help, and you may have noticed that. I'm not good at it. So you're going to have to help me to help you to ask for help. Ah, I don't know if I can. Anyway, I've heard it said that radical hospitality is probably one of the most important functions of a congregation, a community, or a group. What would happen, do you think, if we began thinking about what radical hospitality actually means? how it overlaps with our mission and vision statements, and more importantly, how does it overlap with our covenant of right relations, and how does that all play into hospitality? So um, there's a couple of different kinds of models, and I was just going to share a couple of them with you so you can think about it and let it, fil let it simmer around in your brains. In some congregations that I've been involved with, if you're a member of the church, you're automatically put on, onto a hospitality team. Is you just are, whether you can help out or not. If you're a member, you're on a team. Whether you're infirmed or in a, um, in a home, it doesn't matter. You're on a team. And each week, a team takes on the role of providing snacks, making sure there are beverages, helping up with setup and cleanup. If there were 10 teams, for example, your team would be on every 10 weeks. As well, they'd be, be, be responsible once a month if there was a potluck or whenever there was a potluck and it landed on their Sunday. 
Another model I've seen work is when there's a hospitality of people anywhere from 5 to 15 to make sure that there is hospitality at every service, organizes the monthly potlucks, and is present to help when there are events. I personally like, I'll give you my opinion, you can do with it what you will, as, as what you like, but I personally like the hospitality team model because the teams would be represented, represented by folks from every age group and ability to participate. In other words, each team would have folks that are homebound, they'd have young adults, they'd have retired folks, people that are in their 80s, people in their 20s, in their 90s, in their 30s, and beyond, and everyone in between. What happens with this model is that folks began to connect more deeply with people on their team. They build relationships, they check in on one another, and you could see how good that could happen. That is what I mean by radical hospitality. Not just that there's coffee be before the service, but that we make sure that all are invited to the table, wherever we heard that. That's in our mission. I think that's in our vision statement. Maybe both. Karen? Vision. Thank you. I do not have them memorized, obviously. So don't feel bad if you don't. I don't. I don't think anyone does. Karen does. <laughs> They're on the posters, that's awesome. So, we want to be invited, we all want to be invited to the table. There's not much of a worse feeling than feeling like you're being left out of something or left behind. I know that's a feeling that really strikes at my core and that I don't like. So we want to make sure that we're all invited to the table, that our spirits and our bodies are nurtured and nourished. And in that vein, I'm going to um, ask that the, qu new qu the questions be put up and I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbor for a few moments and if you are online you're going to get put into Zoom rooms. Um, you, can, you can refuse to go into the Zoom room if you don't want to have a conversation. What does radical hospitality mean to you? Does UCE engage in radical hospitality right now? If yes, in what ways? How is that manifested? If no, what would need to happen or change for UCE to be a radically hospitable, hospitable and inclusive congregation? So looking at the time, maximum of um, about four minutes, Mike, about four minutes five minutes. And you can pick one or the other or just sit and think about it too. So, all right. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Talked about that. And maybe having an ability for people to be able to sign up themselves online and that kind of thing. I'm not asking for anybody to tell me they're going to volunteer to do anything today. I'm not asking for that. I'm just wanting people to think about it. What would that be? What would it all be like? What would it be like? We're just visioning, right? I'm not saying, oh yeah, I know, that, I know that people have been working really, really hard and that I know that as with every congregation, we're doing all the things and we're dancing, as I, one of my expressions is, I'm dancing as fast as I can, right? And we also need to be thinking about what's it all going to look like? How do we make it easy? What are the systems we can be putting into place? for making all of, for us to feel really good about being here, to feel like we're moving forward, to having it made easy. I really like that. Thanks for that conversation. That was great. Um, I'm not willing to take comments from the floor, just looking at the time. So, um, but continue this conversation. And if you want to come and talk to me about any of this, please do. And do not by any long stretch of the imagination, I do not want anyone to feel like they're not doing enough or that they should be doing more or that you're not, we're not grateful for your service. And so just know that, that I think that we're doing really, really well and that most of us, a lot of us are dancing about it as fast as we can. So, and all of that is so appreciated. 
So I wrote a couple of words here. So as we venture forth into the last half of this church year, I'm so excited for what UCE is and what it is doing and what it is becoming. I am working here with exceptional leaders, movers and shakers to get this congregation moving forward and keeping its momentum moving forward because it already is moving forward and living into its potential. And I guess what, where I come from when I talk about this and in, in this way is that I really see huge potential for UCE here in Edmonton, for Unitarian Universalism to kind of be something that everybody in Edmonton knows about. We're a little bit the best kept secret in town. And so I would love for us to be so involved in community in, in the entire city for, like I said, to everybody know about the good works that Unitarian Universalists do in this city. So I believe in you, I appreciate you, and above all, I love this congregation. I love being here. And may all that you wish for for yourselves come to fruition. May you become individually, as a group, as a member of this congregation, and may this congregation become all that it can be. Amen. We're just going to take a moment to breathe, to feel our bodies. We'll bring the lights down a little bit. I'm just going to invite you into a time of reflection, of meditation, contemplation, for just a brief moment. First, we're going to center ourselves. Then we'll have about you know, less than a minute of silence. And then when the music, and then Gordon will play some music, and when the music starts, we can begin to think about lighting candles of joy and concern. There is a microphone available. Today you are welcome and invited to light a candle, to come around and light a candle facing the, the cameras to the back, and then speak to your candle very briefly um, if that is what you are moved to do. So let's just center ourselves before that time. I invite you to take a couple of deep cleansing breaths to soften your gaze or close your eyes, whichever is comfortable for you. To feel the air moving in and moving out of your body. To feel that you are indeed alive. Can you feel the joy that is waiting there for you? Can you feel the things that need to be attended to? I invite you to let the chair take your weight, to lean into it, to let gravity pull you So that your muscles may relax, your breathing may deepen, and your mind can quiet. And I ask you, who are you when you are just being and not doing? It is the inside of a vessel that is important. Let's take a few moments of silence. About 45 seconds. Gordon, please. And then Gordon will bring us out of that silence with some music.
you want to speak? Yes. I light a candle for my mom and dad and sister Betty, who are in heaven. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. There's two stations there, too, so. I light, <clears throat> I light a candle for Don Royer. I lit a candle for all the people who were affected in the wars in the Middle East and <clears throat> in the Ukraine and everywhere else. Uh, I, uh, yeah, my family were refugees coming over. I kind of remember what war is like. Thank you, Gertrude. I forgot to ask you to say your name, so thank you. That's okay, no, you didn't, I didn't remind you. So thank you, Robert and Ellen, Gertrude. Brandy, she, her. Uh, my candle's for excitement, um, and I feel like if anybody in my life can understand this excitement, it's maybe some people in this room, in just a little less than two weeks, we go on a family vacation, which is not exactly the excitement, but um, we set uh, start off in New Orleans, and so I will be seeing Miss Lauren Kay in two weeks, and very excited to see her. Uh, she has such an infectious and restorative energetic spirit, and I look forward to hanging out with her for the evening, listening to some jazz in New Orleans. Wonderful. Good morning. I'm Bernard, and I lit my candle for those dealing with acute and chronic health and those in good health. My name is Audrey. I light candles for Bonnie Sharplin, for Thomas Schulke, who died last Saturday after three years of uh, illness, a poet, philosopher, wonderful person, for my great-grandson, great Cason Brooks, and for my new great-great-grandson, Keaton Arthur Brooks. Wow. Uh, I light this candle for my dad and, well, one for myself, dealing with aging and chronic illness and caregiving someone who never cared back. Mm, that's hard, thank you, Karen. I'm going to light a candle before John lights a final candle for all of our unspoken joys and concerns. Um, some of you may have known of or have worked with or been uh, in the delightful presence of Jane Perry. And she has been on a um, tremendously difficult journey with cancer. And uh, she was this holidaying in Hawaii after she retired at, from the Calgary as the music director. And as her partner, Cora, said, she spirit slipped out of her body the other morning. So my prayers and <clears throat> Jane was a light to anyone that knew her or had the privilege of singing under her directorship. It is a huge loss for the Unitarian Universalist community and I, I just loved her. So for Jane and for her partner Cora, and for the people in Calgary that are mourning t today, the, and Ottawa. She was the music director there for a long time as well. So for Unitarian Universalism in Canada, the loss of Jane Perry. And for one last candle of joys and concerns. Yep, come on, Audrey has one more as well. John, can you light two candles for Audrey? And Please. Thank well, you. I forgot about Barb Forbes' birthday. We can't forget about Barb Forbes' birthday. And also, I, 89? My goodness. I was going to say 90, but anyway, the other, the other one is, and, and, and I almost want a, a moment of silence for this, uh, Carolyn McDade, our wonderful, oh. wonderful, composer and creator of, well, I think, 14 CDs with a group of women across the world, is now in her last days and came caught. And I'd like us to keep her in our hearts. 
Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. What a gift her music has been to Unitarian Universalism around the world and for all people that have a spirit, which is, last time I checked, everyone. So, we are spirited beings. Thank you very much for all who lit a candle for those who did not. Uh, were there any uh, candles that need to be spoken or, uh, or acknowledged that were online, Mike? I should have asked you before. From Ruth Marriott, a mega candle of gratitude to each person who spent time and energy working to deal with the building emergency over the last week. Absolutely. Thank you. It was such an undertaking. It was quite the week, and I am so grateful to everyone that was here, especially Andrew. He was here a lot, and he kind of saved the day. So being here when things went kaflooey, it would have been much worse had he not just by chance been here. So thank you to everyone. And now we will build a new way. Hymn number 1017, Building a New Way. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are moved and sing together, Building a New Way. Thank you, everyone, so much. Uh, it has come now to the end of um, the service um, of connection and uh, uh, love. And so I just asked Fergie, we're going to extinguish the candle uh, with these words. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move against domination, against oppression. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move towards freedom, to act in ways that liberate ourselves and others. That action is the testimony of love as the practice of freedom. That's by, that's by Bell Hooks. Does anybody know of Bell Hooks? Yeah, so just, she was an amazing, amazing writer. All about love. I wish to thank everyone that took part in this service that contributed to it from making the slides to making the slides and being service leader to playing the piano to being here to lighting candles to speaking to the candles. Thank you. You are all appreciated. You are all needed. You are all loved. And I offer you these. Oh, don't forget to stay and help with the to de Christmas the sanctuary. As, as you can, whether it's to take one poinsettia to that room or to climb the stairs with that thing. <laughs> it comes apart, don't worry. And I offer you these words. Go in hope.
For the arc of the universe is long and we can bend it toward justice and go in courage. For together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and in the larger world and go in love. Because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform this world. So go in peace and love and hope, my dear gentle people. Amen. And now let us sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. I think we're all familiar with what we do.